right. Hello. You are listening to The Pill Pod. I'm here with Chris, who you might have heard from the previous Vitalism episode. Um, and today we're going to do a very broad introduction to Deleuze. And the reason for that is later in the week, we are going to be interviewing Ian Buchanan, who is one of the foremost uh, Deleuze scholars in the English speaking world, at least, but probably the world in general. You think he's probably he's top five for sure, you think? Yeah, I, I would think so, for sure, at least in Deleuze studies and that whole. Yes, he's the editor and founder of the Deleuze and Guattari Studies Journal. So um, he has that to his name. But because we don't know <laughs> specifically how that conversation is going to go, and Deleuze can be very daunting if you kind of don't know what's going on. Um, so I wanted to do this with you, Chris, this uh, less interview style, but more let's talk about the significance of Deleuze and why it matters. For sure. So. I am not a Deleuze scholar, um, whereas Chris, you are, or was. It's not um, your area now, but you have. <laughs> I, I like to. Unless... I like. I like to say that I'm a recovering Deleuzian. <laughs> and the distinct, uh, what we're distinguishing here is, you can read Deleuze, but to actually be a Deleuze scholar means that you're also reading everybody else who reads Deleuze. So. I've read a fair share of Deleuze, but I don't know all the specific debates that are going on in academia and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, for the most part, we can stay away from that, because this is more of an episode of if you open up a Deleuze book, it's going to sound probably pretty jarring, maybe pretty alienating, and you're not going to know what's going on. So the idea here is to set the stage for that interview that we're going to have so that you know at least where we're coming from and a little bit of what Deleuze slash Guattari in some cases is about. I think that's very well said. So there's, yeah, I was going to do a whole introductory video on Deleuze, but I don't really like doing introductory videos because it kind of stops you from dealing with concepts. So I think this is a better medium for explaining. But we can just tell, we can just tell our... We can just tell our viewers that, you know, Deleuze was born in 1925 in France and died in 1995 of suicide, jumping from his uh, uh, window. Um, he was dying of lung cancer. Um, he had a spring uh, put into his lung at the age of 45. Um, and he took his own life because he felt that we as humans need to own our own death. And that he felt that the cancer that was killing him was was taking more out of his own autonomy, so he took his own life. Yeah, he didn't want to die in a hospital bed, which <laughs> is actually pretty reflective of his philosophical project. Um, so to focus on his philosophical project, which is vast, um, I have broken down this. Chris, I, you can push back on any of these categories if you wish, but just for the sake of clarity, I think the best way to deal with this is to talk about four different Deleuze's. Okay. Do, do you want to hear them? Sure, sure. Okay, I, I would okay. love to hear them. Uh, you can push back, but it basically divides his books into a few different categories. So first, and probably the most well-known, is the Deleuze who writes with Guattari. So D&G, Deleuze. These are the books from Capitalism and Schizophrenia, including Thousand Plateaus, Anti-Oedipus, uh, later on, What is Philosophy?, his book on Kafka, the Towards a Minor Literature. The Minor Literature book, Nomadology. And I know I'm just saying a bunch of words, but we're dividing up his books into his own sections. Then we have Deleuze, the intellectual historian, many of which he wrote these books by himself uh, for the most part. But he writes on, his first book was on Hume. Um, he wrote on Nietzsche. He wrote on Spinoza. He wrote on Leibniz. And this is when Deleuze is dealing very closely with these texts and interpreting them very much for his own ends, in a way. He's not trying to be, you know, here's, here's the story of this philosopher's life. He's more interpreting, oh, we could take this concept and develop it. And he calls them conceptual personae. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, that's, a good way to, that's a good way to get into him. Yeah. And I think these are these are kind of your favorite books, right? Yes, um, I like his monographs on philosophers, and I also like how if you're interested in Spinoza or Nietzsche or Bergson or Kant or any one of them, they're really good to pick up. 
Um, and if you just jump into what is philosophy, which he wrote with Guattari, he reflects on these monographs, right? Like when he starts talking about concepts. So it's good if you pick up one of his books, let's say the Spinoza book or the Hume book, and then jump into the what is philosophy book. He reflects on these and reflects on why these thinkers matter to his new canon, as he calls them. And actually, if you've never read Deleuze, anything by Deleuze before, I think what is philosophy is actually a pretty good place to start because he wrote it at the near the end of his life. I think it was his one of his last books. Yeah. Um, and he kind of reflects on what he was doing the whole rest of the time. Yeah, he says he says he could only write one of these books uh, at in old age. He, and he 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 tries to think of Kant writing the last book, The Critique of Judgment, which is so completely different than the other books. But he says there's something about this old age that makes him get to this kind of reflecting moment on his entire oeuvre or body of works. And it's not a difficult book, so it, it might be a good place to start if you think, oh, this is extremely interesting, but uh, we'll see. Well, it depends on the reader. I don't, that's just my opinion. Um, then, okay, so we have the DNG Deleuze, then we have the intellectual historian monograph Deleuze, and then Deleuze the metaphysician. And this is what... Difference in Repetition is called his opus because it's his most uh, personal intervention into the history of philosophy when he's saying, I'm going to go in a whole new direction from philosophy since Plato. Right, right. Um, it's, it's his, it was his uh, dissertation thesis. Um, it also starts off his, his work. Um, it puts him in line with Foucault as well. Um, and, and it focuses on the conception of difference, which he looks through the entire history of philosophy and targets three main people, um, Freud, um, Hegel, and Leibniz. Um, and, he, and he really goes into these three. And we'll talk about that later. And yeah, you, you mentioned Foucault. So he was pretty tight with Foucault, I guess, in his 70s. And then they had a little bit of a philosophy cat fight, which philosophers are prone to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, tongue in cheek, I define all of 19th century philosophy as Kantians and Hegelians calling each other idiots and, you know, <laughs> insulting each other. That's a pretty... <laughs> actually, if you look at any of Fichte's letters to anybody, that's a perfect definition. He wrote scathing, scathing comments to Hegel and shelling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they're quite personal. So we think of these people as high-minded intellectuals dealing with metaphysics, and then they're just calling each other <laughs> bitches, basically. <laughs> the the, 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 the proto-Twitter. Uh, um, and then finally, there's the Aesthete Deleuze, where he writes on film, and he writes on art, and kind of cultural products um, as aesthetics. And what's interesting, though, is... If you want to do something like film studies or like critical art studies, don't read these because he only looks at movies and uh, art so that he can put his own ideas and say that this is what was happening all along. <laughs> he certainly doesn't like the he doesn't like the classical age or the Renaissance age of art for sure. He does not like that at all. And he's also not aesthetically critical. He's just saying, oh, if you read this my way, then here's all the stuff you can get out of it. <laughs> So time image. So he has two books on cinema and uh, logic of uh, sensibility. The logic of sensation. Uh, sensation, sorry, where he writes on art and things like that. So to recap, we have four Deleuze's, D&G Deleuze, intellectual historian Deleuze, metaphysician Deleuze, and esthete Deleuze. And whichever book you're looking at is going to define the writing style that you're going to be looking at. So uh, I think probably a lot of Deleuzeans would hate that I'm breaking it down that way because they'll say, no, this is a combined philosophical project. I'm pretty sure most Deleuzeans hate each other anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> They're continuing the tradition of <laughs> philosophical catfights. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's the map that I have in my head when I'm opening up this text or this text or this text. That's the personal map that I use. Whether or not it's true or helpful or useful, that remains totally up to you. Um, so how do you want to start this, Chris? We, we could deal with a few different things, but uh, do you have any ideas? 
Um, okay, so pretty much um, when Deleuze wrote his dissertation, he had written on difference of repetition, he'd written his books on Hume and Spinoza, um, and he felt um, that he was at kind of a, a roadblock because he'd written on so many, con- so many concepts. Uh, and he was introduced, actually, to um, uh, Guattari, um, and apparently they spent the entire night talking about concepts, and, and they had a really, really good relationship right off the bat. By the way, all of this information is from Francois Dossier's text, Intersecting Lives. So. And I want to interject there just to say, what's, what's, he called himself... Or he, he was commenting on his own work. And I think he called himself like a bureaucrat or an academic bureaucrat or something disparaging like that. But meeting, with, meeting up with Guattari and becoming friends uh, changed the way that he wrote and presumably the way that he thought. Obviously, we can't decide on that either way. But he, he, re, he re-envisioned philosophy from having met Guattari. And just a little bit of background on Guattari. He was... Uh, a, he was like a protesting academic. He was like uh, in the streets, uh, communist. And he studied psychoanalysis under Lacan. Lacan was his analyst. Um, and he kind of severed ties a little bit because he thought Lacanian philosophy or the Lacan school of psychoanalysis was a little bit too cultish for him. Yeah. He, he said this he actually- in an interview that I read uh Two weeks ago. Interestingly, when they met, um, Deleuze gave uh, Guattari his text, The Logic of Sense, which has a lot of psychoanalysis in it. And the critiques there were of Freud. So apparently, bef- during this era, Lacan had asked Deleuze to, to sit in on one of his lectures uh, during the Logic of Sense time, um, roughly the critique of Freud. So this is an interesting period of, of um, you know, intellectual richness between two thinkers, you know, thinking out politics, how, how these concepts can go out in the street, how they can be taken to the street, actually. So that was a good point that you brought up about his, uh, Guattari's activism. And the Anti-Oedipus book, which is the first book they wrote together, as far as I know, right? Right. Yep. Let's just assume, <laughs> let's just assume that I'm right about that. Um, it was very, it was very much dealing with the problems raised in psychoanalysis uh, more Freudian psychoanalysis than than Lacan, but it was arguing for a a different sort of model. Yes, yes. So it was definitely it was against the kind of you know the the Oedipal the Oedipal complex. Sorry, um, the the kind of triangulation of the mother father etc. Signifier. Uh, they were really trying to target this, and they were looking at different organizations such as the state such as religion, the religious orders, as well as the media, etc. And this brings up a central tenet that's going to define Deleuze's entire trajectory and his whole philosophical project, which is increasingly anti-establishment in certain ways. Um, Because you said this word, the state, and the state is very much a concern to them in the same way that it's a concern to, to Foucault, actually. But instead of having the state as an ultimate position, they're kind of trick, they call it machines, right? They try to figure out all the different machines that make up the state instead of positing an er concept or a totalizing concept like power. Right. And this is one of the, if if you know anything about Foucault, you probably know the word power, but what's very different from people who interpret Foucault and write about Foucault is they presume that power is just this like miasma or this uh, cloud that just exists everywhere in society. Whereas if you actually read Foucault, the way he does his text in terms of madness or in terms of hospitals or in prisons, it's always starts from the details. It's uh, what would you call it? It's uh, inductive reasoning. And he says, okay, here's how a prison works. Now let's establish power and the conclusion of the book is power. Right. And so Guattari and Deleuze maybe extend that concept of power and look at how the flow of power and they bring up these concepts of of suppleness or or molecular, which is the free flowing uh, concept of power and the molecular, sorry, the molar, which is the 
uh, constrictive and segmenti- segmenting and the enclosed kind of aspect of power, the, the, the contraction of power, the, um, the seducing of power, and then there'd be like the supple um, mo- uh, molecular, which is the kind of free-flowing, which is in a good way, it, it opens up structures, but they also limit. I'm going to interrupt you here because this is the big problem that people have with Reed, Dillis, and Guitar is it gets very jargony. And this True. is just meant to be an introduction. So Right, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, don't be sorry. This is the way Delizians always talk, and I'm Indeed. meant to be the the voice of the people here. <laughs> right? The Vox Populum. But if we talk about power, we have hierarchies, right? And everyone can mm-hmm. see hierarchies wherever you look. If you look into schools, if you look into government, if you look into you know, police versus civilian. There's always hierarchies of power. And Deleuze and Guattari investigate this a little bit more carefully, but they also look at the history of philosophy in terms of hierarchy. So even going back to Plato, he makes distinguish or a a distinction between appearance and real. And the real is the, the stable background to all appearances. And appearances are temporal, they're not trustworthy. Um, and then you get copies, like artists copy appearances, which are copies of the real. So it's this hierarchy where you have an invisible background that is the true reality, right? And then everything beyond, or everything that's lower on the, the pole, or lower on the tree, we can come back to that, lower on the tree is less real. So the most real is the best. And this is, he, they attack representation a lot, right? So representation, when you say one thing represents something else, then you're kind of saying that that something else is better and that the thing that's copying it is worse, which creates a hierarchy in thought. But they're also dealing with hierarchies of the state and the family, as you said. Yeah, I, I like this idea of the tree. Um, um, because what is a tree? A tree is, uh, it's vertical, it's standing up. It has one way of expressing itself, which are its branches. Its branches can go in one direction and that's it. Um, and this is kind of brilliantly is leading us into the, the, the rhizome in a second. So if we think of um, what I was saying before, like, you know, religious orders, the state, God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see this at, on the hierarchy of the tree. Right. And so each level of power or each level from the state onward is a kind of a branch that is cutting off your ability to be a free, autonomous individual. So Deleuze and Guattari are trying to think of ways to um, what they would say. I mean, I'm going to use the jargon, but I'll talk about what it is to look about the way of overcoding or or trying to make this tree organism cut completely off or to to flip it right on its head. Right. And um, if we want to go why that is, think of you have the tree of knowledge, which is a metaphor in Western philosophy that at least philosophers use because, you know, it makes them look the most important. But the roots of knowledge are philosophy. And then once you go up the up the trunk, then you have the trunk, which is, I don't know, f- science. So the science is the solid center of knowledge. And then you have the branches and the branches are the most easily removed. So the least necessary. And those are like the applied sciences. So when you Mm -hmm. when you do chemistry, you're not doing pure science, you're doing applied science. So the whole point here, I mean, it's a kind of an inverse hierarchy is to say, what's the most important thing, which is often, you know, metaphysics. And then as soon as you start applying stuff and as soon as you become like, and then the most, the topmost branches, the most useless branches are arts, right? Yeah. So you have that right. So that this is right out of Descartes. So, you know, the empirical sciences, et cetera, et cetera. But notice how there is no room for growth. There is no room for any free creativity. What we have there is what is certain. It's certain that the empirical sciences give us this. It's certain that um, the arts will do this. It doesn't really give any room for novel creativity. 
And this is where Deleuze steps in. And this is why Deleuze has a different canon of thinkers, because he wants to hit Deleuze and Guattari want to investigate the history of philosophy and of psychoanalysis, I guess, to see how they can make these creative inversions on the history that has created this kind of tree structure. So um, how can they do this? And this is called major philosophy. Yes. Um, and major philosophy is their shit list. And I'm being reductive here because <laughs> they write on major philosophy. And anyone who studies major philosophy is going to be, or is probably going to object to this. But we have major philosophy and then we have minor philosophy. So major philosophy is the people you read in an undergraduate philosophy class. You start with Plato, you go to Aristotle, uh, then for whatever reason, skip 2000 or 1500 years, then you're at Descartes, then you have Kant, then you have Hegel, um, and so on. So this is major philosophy, and they want to distance themselves from that, you know, for the most part, there's always exceptions. And then they have a minor philosophy, which includes uh, what you haven't heard of, probably in, a, in most philosophy classes, which is Spinoza, Bergson, Nietzsche, you probably have, but Nietzsche's in this train. So they want to have a, a parallel line of people that were rejecting the norm. They were opposed to the norm in whatever way. Sometimes they were opposed to the norm, sometimes they weren't, but Deleuze and Guattari, or at least Deleuze, no, mostly Deleuze, I think, in this case, right? Yeah, Deleuze, yeah, for sure. These are his monographs. So Deleuze, yeah. Deleuze gets these small ideas out of these thinkers and say, no, they're part of the minor philosophy, which in his mind is good. It's better than major philosophy. Yeah. And it's as, it's as simple as someone like Lucretius's Klinemann or the, the Adam Swerve. He likes this idea of free flowing activity, free creation that, that, that can somehow be spontaneously, uh, spontaneously erupt. He likes this idea, a rupture, a, um, um, Something that's intensive, right? Um, you see a lot of Deleuzean articles, people talk about intensity. What is intensity? So from Lucretius up to Spinoza, and what he loves about Spinoza is this concept of imminence. He has a very strong, imminent kind of holistic model that he that grasps um, uh, the creative structure of reality. So, and I think he calls them orphans, but I'll give you the list, listener, just so you can have the list. I wrote it down. Um, as you mentioned, Lucretius, Spinoza, Leibniz, Hume, Nietzsche, Bergson. Those are the main, the main list of minor philosophers, whereas most other people he would call part of the majority philosophy view. Hegel, especially. I don't think they have profound love for Hegel. Deserved Actually, or he, not, because you know what? He, Our Hegelian... Our Hegelian friends are going to message me as soon as they hear this. I know, but that's he has the greatest. He has the greatest line. He says one of the one of the one of the one of the most disgusting things that he had ever ever seen come into existence was the dialectic in Hegelian philosophy. Yeah, and you can kind of see the reason for this is because Hegel's dialectic of history overall basically explains all of history. So it's totalizing. Um. And, you know, what, we're not going to do that on this podcast, but we can push back on that and say, no, like there's spontaneity in Hegel. There's, there's, it, there really is reason to believe that. But just for the sake of this episode, we're going to reduce it to a binary, which says Hegel's a bad philosopher because he doesn't allow for true spontaneity and true, like, resistance. Because if history is all one process, then what is resistance for? There could be no resistance. So Deleuze and Guattari are very interested in this concept of resistance. And they give it a very physical form in terms of becoming woman, becoming animal, becoming minor. Um, the Kafka book was about Jews. So Jews have to write in German, in Germany, but they come at it from an outside, even though they're you know inside the German geist. But this, no, this, is, this, is, yeah. this is the... This is the beautiful thing about the Kafka book, because he brings up the idea that Kafka is a is a a, a, a Prague Jew. He's from Prague. He's a Ch um, and what he likes about it is one of the first concepts that Deleuze really really works out is the stutterer, 
And what does a stutterer do? A stutterer takes Yiddish and applies it to the major language, which is German, and the stutter adds a kind of intonation to the language, to the word. So it it and then all of a sudden you see the major people, the 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 kind of bourgeois society start using these minor words, which brings out the minoritarian um, uh, politics. Right, and if we want to go into let's let's bring in identity politics here, actually, because it's quite a useful sure. application um, for Deleuze to be a minority. And it doesn't have to be a numerical minority, just like something outside the dominant discourse. So in North American culture, it would be non-white, non-heterosexual, uh, and non-male. And especially in terms of like um, transgressive gender identities, right? In terms of non-heteronormativity, these things are not something that you are. Because if you are woman, black, minor, transgender, or whatever, then you're going to be caught in the logic of the state. So this is his notion of becoming minor, which is constantly reinventing that minority stance. And that minority stance is actually where you get a form of power from. So I don't know if you can think of examples. I think the, the, the first example that comes to my mind is like New York hip hop in the in the early 90s where uh, you get you get all these african symbols as a part of the hip hop you know like uh, africa bombada but even the, even the even the break dancing scene where you where you see african Amer young african americans break dancing in the streets you know kind of taking back the space right sorry to interrupt you oh i i mean that's a perfect example because you're not your identity is not something that you are, it's something that you create. And this philosophy of creativity is very important. And it just doesn't have to do with visible or political minorities either. Um, Deleuze and Guattari saw themselves as a minority, a minority language within philosophy. So it's about everyone should be doing this kind of resistance to the state and to totalizing categories. And that looks different for every person. It looks different and for artists. A, it looks different for scientists. It looks different for philosophers. It looks different for you know visible minorities, right? And this is this is what he this is what Deleuze and Guattari say that creation is. Creation is a form of resistance, a pure form of resistance, actually, um, to create something in replace of something stagnant or static, is a is a form of re resistance. To to read Spinoza instead of Kant or to like someone like uh, Eric Satie in music over, I don't know, Britney Spears or something, uh, to, to get into this kind of... Or Wagner. Uh, we can always shit on Wagner safely because he's an anti-Semite. <laughs> we could just do that for Wagner, yes. So when we are talking about hierarchy, we're, we have our image model of the tree, which is vertical. Some parts are above, some parts are more important, some parts are lesser. And this is where they get the concept of the rhizome from, which is one of the most oft quoted concepts. And a rhizome is a plant like, it's like grass or fungus. Because a fungus or grass, there is no center, right? There's, there's not a single place where everything else comes from. There's no trunk to grass. So when he talks about the rhizome, it's, What's the word? It's non-hierarchical, but it's flat. It's horizontal. So it's, there's not a power horizontal. structure where you have one thing that's important and then everything else is less important, which is, you know, the whole platonic thing. You have a you have a real world, you have the idea, and then you have all the applications to the idea, which are unnecessary. In a rhizome, there's no part that's more necessary to an other which is why it's non-hierarchical. And this is why this quote or this uh, concept is so often redeployed. It's also, you can see this in animal life as well too. He brings up examples like wolf, wolves. The wolf pack is a, a form of a rhizome. It's a, an expression of the entire, um, the entire collective of all the wolves. Um, he likes mice or rats, sorry, the rat. He loves the idea of rats. Um, and they're kind of scurrying around as a kind of, um, animal rhizome. Yeah, and you can um, think of, yeah. I don't know, ant, ant hills, termite colonies. They 
they have sort of a center, but they're much less decentralized than, uh, excuse me. They're much less decentralized than something like a human state, because the state is all about these different organs. You have the legislators at the top, you have your government officials at the top, then you have your bureaucrats, and then you have like your classes. So he, he even comes against Marx a little bit for considering power too stately like, and then his criticism, he criticizes Marx's criticism of capitalism. Yeah, like my, my, my favorite example um, from A Thousand Plateaus is when Deleuze talks about a weed. And what, what is a weed? A weed is something that's horizontal, it's fl that moves horizontally and has a, an infinite amount of possibilities, expressions that it can merge into as opposed to just growing, you know, like a telos, like a, like a teleology, growing into a plant, being just like our structure, we said, like the tree, just being vertical and that's it and growing branches and leaves, etc. This, this is a weed, perfect you... example, right? Because the hierarchy, the state, is the garden and the garden what makes a garden a garden you plant things in horizontal rows you're like envisioning what this garden's going to look like later you have your nice plants up here you have your shade plants in the shade so it's all organized in like a grid like pattern to look good to a certain sort of mind but then the weed comes in and the weed disrupts this planned out representational organization of the garden that's perfect thank you yeah, and it's funny too because let's lose let's use a little bit of jargon here. So one second, let's two two words here. So as as pills as plastic pills said so perfectly, you have this grid like formation of the garden which is coded. It's a code. You put this plant in, you put this seed in, and and a line. Now what does the weed do? It overcodes the code. It goes over that distinction. It goes over that structure. Yeah, you could think of it like uh, an invasive, a virus even. Although <laughs> yeah, vir like, viruses, like uh, cancer. I don't know if we wanted to bring up viruses in times like these, but you know, <laughs> they overcode the hierarchical grid-like organization of things. And he, and for Deleuze and Guattari, this is the goal: is to be the overcoders, be the subversives. And it doesn't mean like you can overthrow a massive state, right? Like you're not gonna overthrow the United States by protesting in the street, but just the act of protesting in the street is an important intensity that you can bring into politics. Right, and and it's so funny that we're gonna have Ian Buchanan on here. Um, I think it's next week because Ian this says week, something hopefully. so- This week, hopefully, hopefully I can oh, get it done. Oh, this week, sorry. I hope, if I can get it done, turnaround time, but yeah. Ian says something brilliant in his article on the internet. He says that if Deleuze was if Deleuze was alive, the greatest rhizome that he would see come into power or come into into existence would be the internet. You could open up, you know, the screens that are popping up. The, I mean, you you know this more than I do. Uh, pills. Yeah, I think I think that dream is dead though. Like this was the whole cyberpunk movement in the '90s. Was like, oh, we have a free space. But now even the internet has become in like com totalized, totalized, uh, categorized. It's extremely hierarchical. So I want to introduce one term. We're not going to do heavy terms here, but we have the rhizome, which is this sort of free flowing. There's no center. It can pop up anywhere versus the tree. And the word for the tree hierarchy is the arborescent. So arbor, arbor in Latin means tree. So something that is arborescent is hierarchicalized. Something that is rhizomatic is free. And you could point to the internet, at least in the uh, mid nineties as being a lot more uh, distributed than it is now. And there, you could still seize upon those tendencies maybe, but you know, the internet becomes more and more hierarchicalized <laughs> and monopolized. So there's another term we could, we could drop here that might help make sense. And that's the nomad. Because the nomad is someone without a territory or someone that can cross freely between territories. And as soon as we talk about the nomad, then there's a whole bunch of terms that we can use <laughs> that if you've ever read Deleuze, you've probably read before. So territorializing and deterritorializing. 
Um, and I think you could probably say that for Deleuze, becoming territorialized, it's not like it's bad, right? But if you get stuck there and you get stuck in your ways and you never try to push against those uh, limits, then you're kind of not living a real life. And you, you said this, if you haven't listened to our vitalism episode yet, uh, you should. But this is kind of the, an area where Deleuze is considered a vitalist, but it can also be applied to politics. If you stay in your lane and you stay in your box, that's your territory. Um, it's not like it's morally objectionable, but the purpose of like living things, of organic things, like, and even including your mind, including your thought, you should be trying to deterritorialize yourself. I think that, that that's perfect. And I like this example of the city because what does a city do? A city is a territory, right? The street goes one way, buildings go up. Um, you have certain places that you can go to, certain um, places to eat, etc. So places it sets you can in walk, a places you can't walk. Oh. Places you walk, you can walk, places you can't walk. So it sets in a set of behaviors. So this is re-territorialization. It makes you, I'm going to use a big word here, converge to that place of power. So it makes you contract a certain habit. Converge so isn't the biggest word you could use, but yeah. <laughs> okay, Let, sorry. Let's go, on about, let's go on about the habit, though. The habit's really key here. Yeah, so, so Deleuze will say that you contract a habit because of re-territorialization because you're forced to walk a certain way forced to go um, to use certain washrooms or to do etc you're supposed to do all of this behavior you're contracting these these passive habits in order be because of the structure because of the as pill said the arborescent structure so the structure of the tree now how can we how can we over or how can we Yes. How can we overcode this coded structure? Besides, well, you know, just running into the street and getting hit by a car, which is not the proposal here. But <laughs> but yeah, how do you how would you overcode the the habit? Well, let's let's give some um, political examples. I, I think they're I think these are fun. So we brought up the example of um, African American African Americans in the 80s and this idea of taking back the space. This is exactly a deterritorialization. I, I think, I think um, uh, Deleuze brings this up in actually one of his lectures. Um, this idea of, you know, even just expressing yourself within the street, taking over that, that, that space, um, overcoding the fact that you are now on the sidewalk or in the middle of the street where cars are supposed to be driving and you've taken over that space, right? This is kind of showing... The major, it, it's it's kind of trying to be, it's becoming and it's trying to overcode or, or or become over the the major. And this is what protest is, right? Because you're entering the street, you take it over. Cars can no longer drive, but as a as a rhizomatic entity, even these police protests, you could say, it is a is is rhizomatic in that sense. That Absolutely it disrupts the code, and the code is just right. cars can't drive here anymore, right? Um, I was also thinking of um, a Canadian example. I think in 1986, um, the indigenous population took over the highway in Quebec um, and Canada brought in the military, I, I believe. And, and here we have a great example because you have a, a, peop a, a minority that's, that's oppressed. Now they are taking to the streets. They're in the middle of a highway. And what do you do on a highway? You speed, right? Unless you're... <laughs> um, so they're they're taking over this space. They're overcoding this specific space. They're expressing themselves. They are right there a line of flight. They are a divergence. Oh wait from wait 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 jargon. Oh jargon. Whoops sorry. Jargon alert. So, okay, <laughs> just explain line of flight. It's a perfect. It's a great so, word for this. So let's let's go into so it. So a line a line of flight here would now be deterritorialization. So it's an actualizing. It's it's a it's an expression of breaking. The structure breaking that arborescent structure. So here you have an indigenous population trying to um, uh, fight back You're being, against. Let's go. Let's go to what actually line of flight means, right? Because he uses the example of a bowman with an arrow. This is what a line yes. of flight is. So right. you notch your bow, you know, from whatever position you have. Because no matter who you are, you're in a territory. 
um, you know, a visible minority, not a visible minority, you are in a territory, you shoot your bow. And this is what the, li the word line of flight comes from. You shoot your bow, mm -hmm. the arrow goes up and you're not gonna, you're not sure where it's gonna land, but it's your moral unction as a living person, as a living being with, you know, will, will to power, you have to shoot your arrow just to see where it lands. And he gets, he gets that concept from Nietzsche. They yeah. both get it from Nietzsche. Very, yeah. very Nietzschean throughout. But then you go find your arrow. Now you're stuck in a new territory. So don't just stay there in your new territory. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like this is good or bad, right? It's not like re-territorialization is always good and territorialization territorializing is always bad. That's not at all what's happening here. But the idea is as a nomad, don't stay in any place too long because then you're not acting out your, your, in, your intensities, the intensities that exist in you as a living, thinking person. I have a, I have a better example. Um, there's a, a 1970s pianist named Messiaen uh, and Messiaen actually um, wanted to break away from the chord, you know, three chord chorus structure in music and decided to mimic bird sounds. And so he wanted to play specific bird sounds. So what a perfect way, what a perfect line of flight. Now you're going to, you're going to create a piece of music that at the same time is rhizomatic because it's joining human creativity with animal creativity. We have two things together conjoined as one, one flowing line of flight, an assemblage here, assembling, assemblaging, ah, assembling an animal line of flight and a human line of flight together. Man, you keep bleeding these concepts so perfectly because this is the body without organs, right? Uh, a exactly. body with organs, like you could think of your own body. It's a structure. It has a certain amount of parts in it, your heart, your lungs, your pancreas, your appendix. Some of those organs are important. Some you can't live without, some you can, but there's even a hierarchy of, of organs in this sense. So breaking even down that hierarchy is the body without organs. It's just intense on its way to something coming from something. And it's not like, oh, I don't have a body. That's not at all what, what they're saying. The idea is instead of thinking of your position in the world as part of hierarchies, think of yourself as something on the way to something else. You're a becoming, not a being. You're not an identity, you're a becoming identity. So you're creating. And then like, you're, it's not like you're gonna finish creating your identity and then just be something. As soon as you get there, then you should be thinking like what, what else can be? And this is, I guess, the political dimension of Deleuze and Guattari, which some people think that he's not political, but the whole idea is just resist because resistance has a value in itself, even if you don't accomplish anything. Like the goal is not, we need revolution. The goal is make sure that you on your own, or not even on your own, but just like as a collective, or whatever part you are, you're not just a member of a class and you're not just a member of a group. You're always on your way to something. And if you think of yourself in this sense, your life becomes a work of art, not a work of you know fitting yourself into a system or fitting yourself as an organ into a whole, into a totality, a state. That that was just <laughs> beautifully well worded. No, I went off. Um, a, I, I went off a little bit. I, I don't usually like to be didactic, but you know what? This is one of my favorite philosophers for exactly this reason. It's like, no matter what you're doing, you could be doing it more creatively. If you're a scientist, yeah. you could be doing it better. Yeah, you could, be, you could be using science for life as opposed to life for science um, in, a, in a creative sense. Or science for death if you're working for fucking Halliburton or something like that, right? <laughs> um, yeah, very, very, very interesting. Um, so there's, he, he, you know, there's great examples with music as well, too. Um, the great French singer Edith Piaf, she would sing normal, you know, 
verse, chorus, verse, but she would sing a little off tune. And the off tune, um, just the sing, just the action of, of singing off tune, Deleuze loved her, loved her. And he loved this idea that, okay, you have someone that's maintaining the same structure of songs like verse, chorus, verse, but is overturning that structure just by singing off. And, and her songs are brilliant. Um, anyways. Okay, so I was going to try to keep... This is a microdose, so I was going to try to keep it to about an hour. Um, we were we said we were going to talk about four different Deleuze's. The DNG Deleuze, Intellectual Historian Deleuze, Metaphysician Deleuze, Aesthete Deleuze. Um, and we haven't really talked about any of them specifically. Oh, but, boy. And we're not going to, I don't think. We don't have enough time. But in each case, when he, like when he's reading a philosopher... He's not trying to repeat to you what that philosopher said, just like baldly. It's not information transfer. It's, it's, here's this interesting concept that we can get out of this philosopher, like the, the, the monad or, or the assemblage or whatever it is. Um, Deleuze as a metaphysician tries to do this. Uh, Aesthete Deleuze tries to do this. Like, let's just read a movie and pretend that it's a Bergson documentary or something. But you know what? But you know what? We can still we can still adhere to your four Deleuze's by taking an example from each. Let's do that. Here we go. Let's start off with the monograph Deleuze for a second with something as easy as the concept. So Deleuze believed that the history of philosophy was about one thing, creation. And he actually says this at the end of uh, what is philosophy. I'm pretty uh, sure he actually world. says that. In the first page of what is philosophy. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Creators, of, creators of the world create. So what is, what is the, what could, can philosophers do but create the concept? So exactly what, what Pill said. So you take something like his book on Spinoza, which is one of my favorites, actually. Um, and this book is, is about Spinoza's philosophy, but it hinges on a line of flight in it called expressionism. How can one express oneself infinitely? And this is also rhizomatic because expression is, is infinite. It's never ending. You have an infinite amount of possibilities to express oneself in either identity, behavior, action, right? This is a great way of overturning those passive habits. So this book focuses on expressivity, expressivity in what he calls the conatus, which is a Spinoza, Spinoza's term for a will, a, a striving. Um, just like that, that idea of the arrow and shooting an arrow like a line of flight, this is how we're supposed to look at a mode of creation, creation as a form of expression. So there's a philosophical example. And it's also not just creation of, I need to sit down and write a book, right? Um, just to summarize the rest of what is philosophy, scientists can either you know, be creative or not. Artists can be creative or not. But being creative at every different moment means a different thing. And that's kind of the the crux, the center of Deleuze's, all four Deleuze's, is that if you're stuck in one place, you're doing something less than what you could be doing. So instead of being, instead of identity, in a very broad sense, instead of things, you should think of things as processes, as things, as, as movements on their way to something. And this is why the line of flight is so powerful, because you're on your way to something. Instead of trying to establish what you are, establish futures, possibilities, even if it's useless, right? This is so, this is so important, because if you, you were reading the history of philosophy, everything's focused on space and time and here and now. And things, but movement. objects, subject versus object, which is the subject, which is the object, you know? Right, and movement, movement overcomes all of this. Movement is this flux, right? And within this flux, we have this great capacity, this great potential for, for creation. Which is why he and ultimately all... opts 100% for Bergson's understanding of time and to a lesser extent Nietzsche's understanding of time versus... Kant or Hegel's sense of time, which is a fixed space. Right. He, he says about Kant, um, one, of the, one of the most ingenious but also maddening concepts is, is um, this idea of taking time and making it clock time, making it internal, making time a kind of circle. Um, he says this in the Kant book. Or being but linear, I, right? Because as soon as you have a linearity, right. 
between cause and effect, then you're doing tree philosophy again. You're doing arborescent <laughs> philosophy instead of rhizome philosophy. Rhizome philosophy right. at any moment has like 20 directions and you have to choose which one to follow and you have to choose well and intelligently, not just doing things for no reason, but you know, taking, taking your intensity in that moment into account in your expressivity. But you, you see, you brought up something really interesting and um, I want to talk about art for one second because I was never an artist. I know you are, but I, was, I came... Was. I, be I became interested in art because of Deleuze and his book, The Logic of Sensation, which focuses on Francis Bacon, was my first real uh, juncture into art. And the one thing that I like about this is that you can really see the creation in this. So there's a painting by um, Francis Bacon about um, Pope Pius VI, I believe. Um, and it's and it's a pope screaming yeah, and his and half of his face is melt melting off. We actually saw this yes. in person, you and I. But yeah, yes, his, his face is melting off, and uh, it's very gestural. It's very impressionistic. It's not like a true to life portrait, although it is based on a true yeah. to life portrait, right? It is. It is based on that. But what he does here is he he does not define the figures of the body. The body is actually blurred. Because what is the body? The body and organs, etc., is back to again this concept of the tree. So he blurs the distinction. But what he does give you is the voice. The mouth is open. So you could almost hear the virtual, the virtual scream of this maddening pope. You can see his jaw extended, the, the darkness inside his mouth. You can see this. And this is what for for Deleuze is is art. Art as a line of flight is this, this kind of raw, um, creative potentiality that breaks open the same kind of blasé art. Yeah, art, art without feeling, kind of, you know, giant balloon dogs and giant <laughs> lollipops or whatever the fuck they're doing now. But, you know, he, he actually loved P Pollock, too, because Pollock created what he called an any space, whatever, the, this free flowing. Yeah. Um, Pollock's art is very non hierarchical because it's just a splatter all over the entire thing. Right. Um, OK, so wrapping up, Chris, I think that you and I have to do another episode on this because I only got through like two paragraphs of my notes. <laughs> I think no, no, but I think we okay. So we did the art. We did the art Deleuze, the the uh, aesthetic art Deleuze. We did the the philosophy Deleuze. We did yeah, but crea creativity of, is kind of the center of each of these things, right? So I would say yeah, so. We're gonna talk to Ian Buchanan. Uh, Ian Buchanan takes a little bit more of a, a a political stance, I would say, on Deleuze. Um, he talks a little bit more about as well as one of our teachers who we won't mention, but um, a political stance to Deleuze because one of the accusations against Deleuze is that he's not at all political or is that he's anti-political right. or something. He wants to do like, I don't know, tree worshiping in a grove or like <laughs> go into your hut in the woods or some shit like Heidegger. But no, Deleuze, Deleuze and especially he when he's writing with movement. Guattari, he's very much about like wherever you're at, I guess here's here's my attempt at a summary. You should correct it if it's wrong. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, if you're a musician, if you're an artist, if you're a political subject, if you're a minority, if you're a reader, if you're a writer, you could be changing the very definitions of what you're doing through your work. So you shouldn't be something, right? It's not about being something. It's about, you said the word the virtual and I promise that we would try not to be jargony, but the virtual, sorry, the virtual sorry. is this pl field. It's a field of possibility. Um, and you should be attentive to that uh, in, in whatever way you are. And, and one of their critiques of the way that we live today is that it's so statist that we can't really see possibilities of action anymore because so many of these machines you know, you can talk about media, schools, ideological state apparatuses might be a good a good fit in here. So many of the machines that we have to live inside of capitalism are, pre are prevent that kind of 
seeing above or below. I think he says in uh, Anti Oedipus, the schizophrenic is capable of seeing above and below. And that's why the schizophrenic is the model for those two books, because they can see past and they can see as a multiple, not as a singular person, but as a multiple person. It t- that's one of the another key concepts, multiplicity. Never think in, right, which, which you know, is in line with assemblages. Um, but a multiplicity is this, like you said, this multiple expressions of, of non-actual, of non-actualized individuality. You, you are endless possibilities, endless possibilities. And um, they mean this quite literally. It's not like some self-help shit that says, be whoever you want. No, it's like, there are options here. Actually, he state. calls them larval selves. There are little larval, yeah. f- little larval selves inside you as these, these you know, burgeoning, um, um, blossoming um, potentials, you know, there, ready to be actualized. Uh, right. So I apologize for this, but I think we got to start wrapping this up. If you want another episode on this, I think we could probably do four. <laughs> um, but I want to keep I, them, I want to keep the microdoses to about an hour. So. Uh, in, just in conclusion, and I want to like this conclusion can last for five, 10 minutes, but we're, when we're talking about Deleuzian philosophy, it's not like truth is not the center of it. It's more like possibility and creation are the center of it. We're not just sure, just find out what is because what is, is what it is now it's static. But if you look at becoming what things could be, then your entire interpretation of the world and the world around you is not going to look so static. So he's, yeah, he says this for every, every different type of discipline is read better, read new, read creatively, make stuff. Yeah. In the Nietzsche book, he says that the powers of the false outweigh the powers of the true. And what he means by that is, is exactly what you're saying. That sounds like Never. a Nietzsche. Did, Nietzsche said something pretty much in, in, in exactly those lines, didn't he? I, I think so, yes. So, um, I kind of want to search it yes. up because it's a freaking great quote. <laughs> well, it goes in line with a lot of your videos. A lot of your, a lot of your uh, videos on YouTube are, are, are very much on, on, you know, sketching the surface of that. Um, it's a shame because I wanted to talk about univocity and the metaphysics of his philosophy. But next time, next time. Um, but yes, I, I definitely think that he, this is a philosopher that is an artist, number one, uh, and, and is creating um, a manifesto for other philosophers to not just be bureaucratic academics, historians working on you know basic ideas, but to be free-flowing experiences um, uh, ex- experimenting and investigating expressions of ideas, and and you see this with everything they've done, from writing on literature and philosophy and poetry, um, art, everything, politics, everything. I think I remember the the quote that I was thinking of. Nietzsche says, uh, "The the true or the true world. Wait, the false world was always the true one." And the true one was only added by a lie. And obviously that's a commentary on Plato, who believes that, you know, everything else is representation except the true world. But he said the false, the world of appearances is the one that's always real. And then trying to get out of that real world to the double plus real world, you know, getting out of the cave. That's the mistake. You should be looking at the world as you're in it. And for mirror research in vitalism, this is extremely important because when life is at its best, when life is living, it's struggling against its conditions, its extant conditions to create conditions in which it could uh, be more than it is, evolve. I, I like that because um, Deleuze's favorite example of this is his example of the tick. And he loves the idea of a tick because a tick can just sit there on a tall piece of grass, you know, waiting for an animal to come just so it can drop by. But all it's, the only thing that it has to express itself is its its um, olfactory senses. So its sense of smell, right? Uh, it's got very poor um, vision. So it's just, it's trying, it's using this to the most 
it's using every kind of feature of itself, you know. All right. Well, I guess just to summarize, like, no matter what you're doing, be an artist at it, I guess. Um, and it doesn't have to be to get to somewhere. It doesn't have to be to accomplish something specific, but you're being more alive while you're doing that than when you're falling into line. And this is this is the big point, especially when Deleuze is with Guitari, is resist for the sake of resistance, because that's that's more in line with life. Can I can I just, can I just bring up one sure. thing? And it's about you, it's about you, unfortunately. Oh God! And I know you don't. I, I know you don't like. No, this, you're gonna but, um, you're gonna collapse my uh, sense of uh, distance here from the object yeah. that I'm discussing. A anyways, um, I I saw your your recent um, video last night about how you make videos, and I found it very Deleuzian, actually, because even the term plastic pills, when you just start describing the concept of pills, and then the concept of plasticity, plastic, those two concepts create a multiplicity. Like this is a perfect example of Deleuzian philosophy. Yeah, it's deterritorializing and territorializing in the same word. Exactly. So you have this the plasticity of society, the plasticness of, of, uh, of mundane existence, and then you have pills, which are, you know, the kind of binary of the mind and the body, right? The pills, you know, you know, conquering or how did you say it? You said um, control. But I would love I would love it if you overinterpreted this because I think when I had made that stuff I had never read Deleuze yet. So just overinterpret it. You can you can publish a paper on my on my larval genius that I didn't even no, know what this, I was doing. But this but even this even this example, um uh and you and the funny thing is, what a great example. I, and I'm gonna continue with this and you're not cutting this out. Because you used to paint uh pills as well too. Like you show in the video, you painting these pills and you take this possibility. This is becoming Listen increasingly this. uncomfortable. <laughs> you take this possibility and you actualize it into art. And not only does it have an intensity, meaning it's got this divergent line of flight here. It's got this multiple meaning of plastic and the pill. And now it's an artwork. Now it's, now it's an extensity. So it's got the intensive, which is the... The, the kind of pure um, overcoating, and it's got the extensive, which is now the actualized line of flight. Anyways, I'll there think you I, go. I can, I can do you one better, and it's what we're doing now, what the channel is doing, what the rest of the podcast guys are doing. We are trying to deterritorialize education from being a university pursuit, because the university, uh, yeah, uh, Let's just let's just go no. Let's just go mum on that because <laughs> the university is a terrible place. But we still we're de we're deterritorializing education by doing this instead of doing that. And we're gonna go have to we're gonna have to go back to doing that presumably soon. But this is better. This agree. This is this is prime deterritorializing of of a hierarchical structure, a stupid hierarchical structure. And I think, yeah, this is a, a much better virtualize or what do we call it? Expression into the virtual of making education free and online. You were about to say great again, weren't you? What's that? <laughs> I said, you were about to say make education great again, weren't you? Th those I'm, words, I'm those words never crossed my mind. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. More right, like, so more like moving. make it free again. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, um, moral of the story: keep moving and keep creating. I think I'll close it down on that. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, if you want more of this, comment. Otherwise, we won't do it. But you know what? We might do it anyways, because we got a lot more to go through if we're going to do an introduction to Deleuze. Anyway, our next episode will be with esteemed top five worldwide researcher on Deleuze, Ian Buchanan. What? what? And I think we're going to probably like, let's try to not talk too much during that. I think I mean, Ian's a chatty guy. He'll probably have a lot to say anyway, but. I think so. That'll too. be mostly an interview style rather than a conversation if I if I get my way. So uh, stay tuned for that. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be probably the best content I've ever produced just because we have an academic celebrity. So 
And thanks for having me on the the podcast again. Oh, you're going to be back. I'm... This was a microdose, but we're going to go do an overdose. We got to keep on theme with the pills, right? <laughs> All right, Chris. <laughs> great to have you. Uh, Thank don't you. Go turn your AC back on because I'm, I'm freaking dying in here. So. Me too. Oof. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone.